Assalamu alaikum, Amin here with Sira Masters, developing the Muslim mindset for success. Books will inform your mindset. I read books. This is a book review. Let's get into it. Okay, so today's book review is on The Way of Men by Jack Donovan. Now, this topic of masculinity, what makes a man a man? What is masculinity? It is very relevant. That's why I picked it up. I mean, I'm interested in psychology, behavior, stuff like that. But also, this topic is very relevant. And you might think it's only relevant maybe in the West, where people are starting to say, um, you know, there's not just two genders, or they're starting to say there's a third gender, or they're starting to say that there's no real difference between men and women. I mean, it's not new. This is, seems to have been going on for at least, you know, 40, 50 years now. Um, and the social norms in the West are being questioned all the time. If you look back to the 60s and 70s, it's very different to today. And that is a short period of time. And even today, things that were accepted 10 years ago are being changed as well. So the change is very rapid and people keep asking questions about what is human nature? How should things be? What is normal? What is not normal? And don't think ever that these changes are going to happen isolated in the Western world. The effect because of globalization, because media is available all over the place now very easily, these ideas are being spread uh, to, to the East and to the Muslim world, of course. So this phenomenon, right, of questioning what masculinity is, how a man should be, um, is relevant to everywhere. And to, don't worry, these, these ideas are being imported into the Muslim world. Don't you worry about that. So it's very relevant no matter where you live, no matter what your religion, what your, your nationality is, okay? So that's why I picked it up. I'm interested in it, but also I know it's relevant to me, okay? And it's relevant to men just as relevant to women because we'll get into that. So this book, the approach of this Jack Donovan guy who wrote the book is quite a casual one. What I mean by that is he, he's not like a scientist, he's not an academic, he's just writing some ideas, some thoughts. He has done some reading and some research to write this book, but it's quite casual. He's not coming with scientific evidence of this and, and, and you know, experiment of this and well, he's, he doesn't come with that and I quite like that because I am not convinced purely with numbers and data and, and scientific uh, experiments. If you learn into how, if you look into how experiments are done and how conclusions are drawn from the data, you'll find that it's quite biased a lot of the time. So we can't only use that. What I like more and more is anecdotal stuff, stuff which is not numbers based. It's not this is yes, this is not black and white. It's more. Um, historical perhaps. So I'll just give you two examples of the kind of proof that he comes with in the book. One being historical. So he basically says, if over thousands of years of human history and over thousands of different civilizations, men acted like X, Y, Z nine times out of 10, that means that is a masculine thing to do. It's naturally built into men to behave like that. Now, some examples that he brought is stuff like leadership. If you look over thousands of years um, in thousands of different civilizations, Nine times out of 10, men were the leaders, right? So when you look like that, look, there's no data. We're not talking about data here. But when you look at that, you say, if men always ended up being the leaders of the tribe, of the country, of the nation, whatever, that means it's, there is something naturally built in there that caused men to A, uh, want those positions or A, be able to take on the positions and B, for women to kind of be happy with that situation and to allow it to happen, right? Uh, we can't pretend that uh, women, if women really hated that so much that men were always the leaders, right? And it was natural in them to feel like they want that position just as much as men, then I don't think over thousands of years uh, we would have seen men always being the leaders. The women would have done something about it, but they didn't. So it kind of suggests that women are comfortable with not being the leaders all the time, at least the people like right at the top taking all the, the responsibility and stuff like that. Uh, so that's the first kind of proof he brings is the historical narrative. The second thing he brings is the kind of biology and it's kind of... Um, you know, he looks at it from an evolutionary way. Of course, he's not a Muslim. He's just, you know, uh, I guess he's American. Um, and, and he so looks at it like the bio biology kind of thing. So he says, men, um, men have, their, they're bigger than women, they're stronger than women, and their tasks naturally, because of the way they physically are, are to, you know, hunt or to defend. Um, and also they have a built-in biology of wanting to have their um, genes spread uh, and so, so forth. Also, the fact that women get pregnant, they have children, they look after the children, at least the first year or two, they really have to look after the children, they have no other choice. Um, that means bio biologically, uh, men and women are gonna have different roles and the fact that the woman has much 
uh, much more to lose, if you like, when she's raising the child, she's much more vulnerable. That naturally means that she has to kind of be in a more kind of safe, stable, com comfortable area, whereas the man is free to uh, go and, and perhaps defend the perimeter of the area or whatever it is. So he brings the historical and the biological narrative to back up most of what he says in the book. Um, now, some things he, he mentions in the book uh, are, for example, values of men. So he says, I actually can't remember them all, uh, but one of them is honor. So uh, men have this uh, built-in uh, aspect of concept of honor, which is very important, and it's what regulates um, behavior between men. It's why men are very competitive on one hand, but then they also um, are quite cooperative with people that they trust, right? Um, and he said, it's because we have this code of honor where we look to people, if they have certain traits, we respect them and we can work together. And if we don't work together, we all lose out. And so men have something built in where they compete with the other, right? And he mentions this, that there always has to have be another like to, to oppose men. So men co group together and cooperate, right? And it's that enemy, if you like, that causes us to cooperate and to compete with another group and that group cooperates, okay? So honor is something he mentioned quite a lot. Um, something else is mastery. Um, that, again, the aggression and the competitiveness that men seem to have built into them, it's, it's a, a staple principle of masculinity and being a man. Okay, uh, he brought some other uh, kind of principles of masculinity. I've forgotten them, but I'm not going to all the information. I'm just giving you an overview in this in this review. Um, another, another thing that which really struck my mind as something fresh and a fresh idea I've not heard before is that he said to define a man, you need to take the morality out of the question. Now, why does he say that? He says that um, what feminists and what uh, people these days tend to do is they say a true man is a man who does X, Y, Z. Those X, Y, Z things being just generally good things that any good human would do, even a good woman would do that. So, for example, a man w w never hits uh, his, his wife, okay? But that, that's not something specific to a man. A woman never hits her husband either, right? It's, it's, it's not something which you can say is purely for men. And he says, well, that's why we have to take the, the stuff that is good, principles and values, take that out of the picture and look at what makes a man a man. Whether it's a good or a bad thing, just what makes a man a man in the first place. And he says, why do men look up to people who are not always morally good? People like, he mentioned like, uh, you know, Don Corleone from The Godfather, um, I don't know, these kind of gangster heroes uh, in films. And even historically, uh, the people we look up to, uh, they're not always the mo big, most moral characters and figures, okay? Now, why is this? He says because they had manly traits, they had masculine traits, and they may have done evil things, but men naturally respect other masculine traits. So basically, what he comes out with is that there are masculine traits and then there are traits of a good man. The good man traits are moral things, right? Like not hitting people, looking after your family, blah, blah, blah. That stuff that we know. And, and so he says that there are, they're two separate things. And basically, the traits of men aren't always going to be good things purely. And I quite like that. It's like, we have traits which, are te which can be negative, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just humans are made with, with negative traits sometimes. <clears throat> For example, women are known to gossip, yeah? We could say it's, it's something built into women. Um, women shouldn't gossip, and a good woman doesn't gossip, but that's something which is a trait that the feminine tends to have. Say, similarly, men will have negative traits. For example, men quite easily become arrogant. That is a negative trait. It's something a good man wouldn't do. It wouldn't, a man wouldn't become arrogant. But nonetheless, it is something that men tend towards. And so we accept it as being part of the masculine to have arrogance. But then when you merge it with what makes a good man morally, we filter that out. So if you like, imagine a Venn diagram yeah, with the two circles of masculine traits and what makes a good man. Put them together. And the, the area where they intersect, that is what a good Muslim man should be. So you get these good manly traits, which are natural, filter them through Islam. What ends up on the other side is how a Muslim man should be, right? And so you get stuff like, for example, um, competitiveness and aggression. It's something which is masculine, right? But when you filter it through Islam, what you'll find is that the aggression, the competitiveness stays there but it's channeled in a good direction, okay? It's channeled in a good, good direction. And I found this, I'm not 100% convinced of, of the whole concept yet, but I did find it quite refreshing and something new to think about.
Um, and then I'll just come to the conclusion he comes to. He says, the world today is run in a feminine way. It's very uh, easy. There's not much competition. Everyone's trying to protect each other. Everyone's trying to be as comfortable as possible. He said, that is, a, that is the way that women tend towards. If women could control the world, they would like the world to be like that. A way uh, which is very, uh, no competition. Everyone's nice to each other. Um, there's no kind of uh, fighting. There's no competition. Um, everyone's comfortable, uh, going always towards more and more comfort. Um, whereas the masculine way, uh, obviously men also like comfort, but men also love challenges and they love competition. And so he's saying that um, the way the world is currently, especially in the developed world, it is uh, built on femininity and it's moving more and more towards femininity. And I thought that was quite an interesting idea as well, um, that the world is actually being shaped in a, in a feminine way. Um, the more you develop, the more you move towards the feminine perhaps. Uh, and of course we need um, imbalances in everything. So that was kind of his, uh, his conclusion, is that you know, men need to, uh, need some, to express their masculinity in a, in a real way. They, it can't be a fake thing. <clears throat> they can't be boxed up in offices um, and, and have all these laws telling them, oh, you're racist and you're this and you're that. Men need to have a, a space where they're allowed to be competitive and, and it's fine. It's not damaging the society because that's how it always was. So overall, I say it's a very good book. Um, it's not... Books, you know, I don't read books to be convinced of them and to take in everything and drink it and then keep it in me. And I, halas, I think like that. What I do is I use it as data in. I filter it through the way I see the world and I filter it through Islam. And then what I don't agree with, I, I throw out. But it's important to have that stuff coming in and those ideas coming into my head. So I'm not going to say I agree with everything in this book. And I don't think you'll ever find a book where you agree in, with everything uh, except Quran, etc. But I did think it was, it was pretty good. I don't think I've, I've read something like this before. Um, I like the idea that he, he, wasn't, he didn't feel the need to back it all up with science and evidence and all that. It was more casual. It was just ideas coming into your head, and I enjoyed it. So I would recommend you to read it. Even men, women, everyone should read it. And just, just like read it and just like listen to what he's saying. You don't have to agree with it all, but it's some interesting ideas, you know. And, and maybe you'll find your, you, you become stronger in your current opinion or you change your opinion. Either way, it's good to kind of challenge your thoughts or to add to your thoughts as well. So uh, thanks for listening to this review of the book, uh, The Way of Men. And just to finish it off, he says, The way of men is the way of the gang. And that men operate in groups of up to 15. And once it gets beyond that, men don't operate too well. And that's why on the government level, it's a bigger scale than what men can operate effectively in. And he says that's part of the problem as well. So that's interesting. The way of the men is the way of the gang. Interesting. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala.